Good evening. I am uh, so happy you're here. I'm with my my dad. I, dad, do you mind? Do you want to go by your first name or you want to go by Xcal? Um, Xcal is fine. Okay. Well, that's my dad, Xcal, <laughs> and uh, he is gonna he. I'm a little bit nervous. He's going to be talking a little bit about his experience in the business world, his background, some perspective he has. And I really, hey, Avery, um, I really appreciate um, his perspective. And I think that he has been, at least when I've been calling him every other night or so, been able to articulate some things that really clicked for me. And um, I'm excited to have him talk to you tonight um so dad <laughs> thanks so much for being on I'm, I'm i know that today was your last day off um but i'm thank you for giving me some of your some of your time i know you just talked to me privately anyways but it's nice to nice to have you here <laughs> thanks for having me in then dc yep and and yeah so dc is not my given my uh given my birth name so there might be some uh slip-ups but we're gonna try our best uh, right. yeah so here's my first question um can you talk a little bit now <laughs> you can contain or expand this as much as you want <laughs> but I'm, I'm wanting to, you to give a little bit of your educational background but we might we probably don't need to hear about preschool or um primary yes, school yes i was a dropout that's right <laughs> yeah we're both dropouts. I'm an Emily. Yeah. <laughs> right 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 so um, if you can, I'll uh, put the ball in your court. Okay. Um, I guess education and also background a little bit. I uh, grew up in the Northeast, came from uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and attended uh, grade school uh, and high school there, and then went off to uh, school in Western Massachusetts for a couple of years at University of Massachusetts. And my best friend was going to school down in Florida at the time and uh, transferred down there with the idea I was going to be a marine biologist. Uh, transferred down to Florida, uh, ended up getting a, a degree in, uh, in the sciences, and uh, immediately um, found myself in business and in sales, and uh, ended up going out to Texas with a company that I was working with through college, and attended, uh, attended graduate school. I got my MBA in, in Texas. Um, while I was there and have, except for two, two quick years in Illinois, have lived the rest of my, my life in, in, in the great state of Texas. Awesome. That's, and I, I think you enjoy the heat in the winter a little more than endless snow. Is that? Uh, that's right? correct. Uh, mm -hmm. I tell people that when I was, when I was thinking about going away to college, I took some little kid from the neighborhood, dressed him up in a snowsuit and started walking south. And as soon as people started <laughs> asking me, what was the kid wearing? I figured I was far enough south and I could stay there. <laughs> uh, not that I don't enjoy snow from a recreational perspective, but uh, I enjoy the, the warm weather. Me too. Me too. Um, here's my next question. So you, you mentioned a little bit that you had moved to Texas for um, some work experience. Can you expound a little bit on um, what you did to kind of pay for, pay for school Sure. Um, and just, I know you've had a very varied career, so. Sure. Um, be glad to. Uh, I actually uh, found myself in, I've, I've been working since I was uh, 13 or 14 years old in summers and breaks and things of that nature. I uh, always found myself working during the summertime. And when I was in college in Florida, uh, I started working with a company that uh, was established back in 1868 that um recruits college students to sell books door to door. They're called the Southwestern company. And they are, um, I think great American is, uh, is their um, bylog now, but I'm not sure. And uh, they have been around for a long time, have recruited some amazing people uh, through the years. And uh, so for a number of my summers in uh, undergraduate school and in graduate school, uh, I worked for Southwestern. Uh, I sold for them during the summertime. I recruited a personal team. I built an organization there. Uh, we went out and sold books in different parts of the country, and it was a an amazing experience. Certainly, a very challenging and hard uh, deal to do, and um, and and so it was a it was something that really established me. Again, I had no business experience, but that really kind of drew me to the business world, and uh, found I really 
enjoyed business. In fact, when it was interesting because when I was in college, my perspective was business majors really um, got their majors because they weren't really smart enough to take the math and the sciences that all the smart kids took. And, uh, and I found that now that I've been in business for years and years and years, I'm one of those guys that people make fun of. Um, but I, have, I loved it. And I love the business side of it. I love the selling side of it. I love the building um, company side of it. I like building things in general. And so um, had I've established a number of companies on my own uh, over the years. I worked for a number of great companies as well. Um, back in the 90s, I, I worked with a, a, a startup company in uh, the Houston area called Knight Rider that grew to the largest um, litigation document services company in the United States. And we eventually uh, were sold to um, to Icon Management, it became Icon Management Services, and uh, they're now owned by Rico, I think. But we were, um, we ended up being growing that to about an eight hundred million dollar organization while I was there, and uh, had a great time. Met people from all around uh, the world. Really, uh, we had offices in Canada and here in the U.S., and there were some uh, overseas offices. The reality was, it was a it was a phenomenal um, learning experience, and uh, really appreciate all the all the times I had with all the folks that I work with there. Uh, and so I'll talk with many of them um, today. Uh, went from there to um, taking some time off. We ended up, um, we've always been involved in uh, real estate. And so we uh, had bought a number of apartments and things of that nature and was busy with that. And then in 2002 started um, um, a litigation services company of my own in the Houston area and worked with that for several years. And, uh, and we ended up um, selling that um, after a number of years and got out in 2017. I now find myself working for uh, in the homes in the home building industry uh, on the sales side and um, have also done a lot of consulting with uh, with companies as well, developing uh, plans for their sales teams and things of that nature. So um, I have uh, I, I have a lot of different kinds of experiences as far as that's concerned. I don't, I don't know if that makes me an expert or not. I don't think it does, but uh, I certainly have, uh, I have an opinion about everything. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, I think it's, I mean, I think it's safe to say that you have an, an academic knowledge and you also have a practical knowledge of, of putting that knowledge to you successfully in and I think it's meaningful to set, to know that, hey, you have developed businesses to a high level. And so that must, you know, that 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 would I mean, obviously, I'm biased because I'm genetically related to you. But um, I would I just from like that at least has a little bit of weight for me in terms of maybe listening to some of your knowledge on the business side. And we worked um, together for a few years, right? Yeah, I worked for him when we were doing the legal document, you know, the deal with lawyers and stuff, which is probably why I love watching all like legal law tube, as it's called. And uh, yeah, this, it's definitely interesting to see the back end part of um, trials come together for like trying to get the evidence ready and all the copies that have to be done and all of the databases that have to be created to like sort through the evidence and stuff. And so it's, it's a whole, right. it's a whole thing. <laughs> so you know, we worked together for, for a few years. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned when you were in college that you in a little after college that you had built an organization selling door to door. Mm -hmm. And so um, would you classify that as a multi-level marketing company and if not why not um i i guess in uh some definitions it certainly would be um it's a uh southwestern was a part of the direct and is i think a part of the direct sales organization uh association that i think all the multi-level marketing companies are also a part of as well and uh you know certainly from that perspective there was a um uh, i think there's some similarities with multi-level marketing I do think that um, the, the, a couple of differences, one is that they only um, market or at the time they only marketed their um, their books during the summertime with college students. Uh, and so it was a three or four month um, process as far as that's concerned. There were other companies that had full were full time, but the college student portion of it, that was the foundation of their business that started in 1868 uh, at that point in time was uh, was 
um, strictly in the summertime. Um, the other difference between that and multi-level marketing is the fact that it was, was like I said, strictly in addition for three months. Um, it was really, um, it, it was explained and it was um, built um, with the idea that if you joined the organization, that you had you had to work really long hours and sell hard if you were going to be successful in that program. And so it was, I think, very important to make sure that um, people walk, walked into it with a clear expectation of what um, the real deal looked like. So that they were, um, so they were set up to be to be successful. And frankly, from a management perspective, you weren't successful if your people weren't successful. If they didn't stay, um, you know, they certainly they turned in all their inventory, they got their money back, um, they paid for their own expenses. So from that perspective, they were out that. But um, you didn't make any money off them unless they they um, actually made sales, and you're paid on the um, the wholesale value of those uh, those products that they sold. Um, and so from that standpoint, um, there are similarities. There were multiple levels. You had teams underneath you all of, and, and, you know, the, uh, the reality was that you wanted every single person that came with you to, to be very, very successful. And so you spent a lot of time back at school teaching them. And then on, and during the summertime, you took time away from your personal sales to go and work with people to make sure they were successful. And, uh, I mean, we were blessed enough to have a lot of folks that were very successful that, doesn't say everybody was there. Uh, there are, were always um, people that left during the summertime, but uh, yeah. the vast majority of them did well. Yeah, I remember. I mean, we we hosted several Southwestern students for several summers um, when I was still living at home before I got married. And it was a rigorous mm -hmm. it was a hard schedule. They they left the house at 6 a.m. and they came back at 10 p.m. or sometimes, I mean, 9, 9 to 10 p.m. I mean, it was a full day. And I think they understood that they were yep. going to be working hard. 80 hours a week. Summer. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was rough. And you could tell, like, they just worked their butts off and they knew what they were getting into when they signed up for it. So and, and, for the most part. Uh, I felt good enough about it that um, I recruited my my sisters to go out and work, and one did well, and the other one um, left early. But you know, we love yeah. her too. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then um, your brother, my um, my youngest son, um, sold for three summers as well. So yeah, uh, it, there certainly is a legacy there. Yeah. Uh, my next question is: so having worked in sales for a long time, building businesses and being plugged into businesses mm -hmm. um what do you see what differences do you see between multi-level marketing and traditional business models um, i think the traditional business model has a, a clear separation where uh, with the customer uh, the customer of a, of a tradition and traditional business model is external to the organization um and, uh, and certainly everything that the com company does is focused on the customer uh, with multi-level marketing, I think the, that level is blurred um, it, with a, a lot of multi-level marketing that at least I've been uh, exposed to. I've heard uh, pitches on a number of the organizations. It seems as though that a customer level is also some many, in many ways um, the very first level of an organization um, because there's so much um, inventory warehousing that's done on uh, on the part of the actual that first level, uh, in other words, everybody is is intended to have an inventory, and they're actually encouraged to build that inventory up in order to be able to quickly service customers and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's not a um, that's not uh, in in a traditional business model. Um, inventory is looked upon as a, um, a as a cost of business, whereas mm -hmm. it seems as it seems almost as though that the multi level marketing. Um, people that are selling the opportunity almost talk about that as um, sales that they do. Yeah, they get, well, from my understanding, the two multi-level marketing companies that I've been in, my upline, so the people who recruited me, made money when I made purchases from my two companies, Mary Kay Cosmetics and Young Living Essential mm -hmm. Oils. So even if I purchased that amount and I sold it, they didn't make money when I sold it. They made it when I hit the submit button on the website to place the order. Okay. And so, which I, I think that sounds a little different than Southwestern. The book it is. Situation. It is. Yeah. The, the, the Southwestern side 
and certainly on a number of direct sales sides, um, you're you're paid on delivered merchandise as opposed to um, merchandise you may have on hand during the summertime, um, but haven't sold yet. Yeah, you know, everything everything got paid, all the money, all, all of it got um, got determined after the summer was over when everything was fundamentally um, closed out. Okay, and I, I've I've heard a couple of people in the anti MLM community, so the anti multi level marketing community, um, wonder if Southwestern Advantage is a multi level marketing company. Like the concern, and it probably is, but I'm saying there the concern is. Um, how are people making money? Obviously, they're making sale on the educational books they're selling, but the uplines or the managers don't get paid until the summer's closed out, which I really appreciate. Because yep. um, I actually have it, strong, yeah. I think it depends on on, on that, someone's definition of multi level marketing. I mean, if your okay. perspective is any company that's involved in direct sales that has multiple levels of um, people that get paid on the product or service, then yes, it is a multi level marketing company. Um, yeah. If the perspective is that it's um, it's it's identical to um, companies that um, push inventory down through their um, channels or pipelines or quadrants or pyramids or however they describe right. it, um, then the, the answer to that is no. There's not it 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 doesn't it doesn't function like that. But yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that a lot of the processes and procedures and um, support system isn't uh, isn't very isn't identical. In, yeah. In, in, and yes. I, and I, I, yeah, I get that. I, um, I think I just, I personally appreciate that the, the managers don't get paid. I mean, obviously they're working and they're giving up their own personal sales at times when they're on the field, helping their team out, but they don't get paid on that, um, yep. on their team being successful until after everything's closed out after everyone, every, all the inventory has been returned. And I, I right. can appreciate that, but um, kind of talking about that risk of like inventory. Um, my next question is, what is the difference in how business risk is allocated in more of a traditional company compared to a multi-level marketing company? Um, uh, that's a great question. And, uh, I, and I think there's, again, there's similarities there as well as differences. I think in a, um, it, it depends on how you're classifying business risk. If I'm the owner, quote unquote, of a multi-level marketing company, i.e. I'm an independent contractor who says, hey, I'm working for Amway or I'm working for Am Living or I'm working for Mary Kay or whoever, then, um, yeah, there is risk there because I am um, spending my time and money and, uh, and energy and dedicating that to the success of me being able to go out there and market products. And then I guess at the same time, if I want to also recruit people to work with me in the same organization and, um, you know, and you, and as a, as the owner of a company, you bear all the risks, much like if I were running a, I decided to open a restaurant tomorrow, um, you know, I'd be looking at probably um, anywhere from three months to a year's worth of um, losses in my business. I'd have to have a way to um, pay my, you know, pay for the, the journey while I was going through that until the business was making enough money to provide the extra income back to me as a return. Mm. And that's true for uh, for any business. Um, there's a the risk of going out of business. Uh, it's a it's a very real risk, and it, the market isn't isn't um, kind or pleasant or forgiving if you right. don't do thing or you don't make mistakes or if you make mistakes. And yeah. that's uh, and I think that um, the where the um, and, and so that's that's the difference. Um, the business risk is um, is more i think it's it's more centralized in a traditional company in the leadership or management of the company the difference is when i'm a in multi-level marketing as an independent co um, contractor or an independent marketing agent uh, i'm i'm that person as well uh, i'm at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of the company but um you know certainly all the risk is is on me you know i've got all of the financial risk at that point in time the good news is hopefully they built a good system that allows me to be successful if I implement it. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of taking in everything you said. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree. I, I mean, I, I, I think the risk, I mean, the whole, the way that in the way that commissions are paid out and having to 
and being paid on any inventory that you already purchased from the company. I think that's, I, I obviously have a, I obviously have big feelings about that in multi-level marketing. And I know that there are, there is legitimate risk in traditional business models that well, as well, I've seen restaurants open up and close down and, you know, like I'm not saying that another type of business is better than an, an MLM. I just think like some of, some of, some of the models are seem to open up, seem to be able to be exploited more than other models. Of well, and to, say, to be fair, I mean, this is getting a little bit off track, but I, I hope yeah. it's okay to, to yeah, mention fine. this. Um, the thing about businesses, I mean, this, uh, you can look at the statistics from a business perspective and see the percentage of businesses that fail every year. And, and it's, it's high. In other words, yeah. new businesses that are starting up better than 50% don't make it a year. Um, and financial problems are typically um, at the root of a lot of those. But the reality is it's more than just financial issues. It's business decisions that get made. It's, you know, not being properly funded. It's not having, you know, clearly identified their market. I mean, there's lots of things that go on there. Yeah. Um, I, I, the, um, the, the key relative to, I think, any successful business is that the business has to have two, I think, two or three clear um, focuses as they as they move forward. They have to have the um, they have to be focused on their clients. They have to provide a service that's needed and valuable, and um, and listen well to their clients. I think the second thing is they have to treat their people well. They have to m make it a great place to be and have it be uh, in order for it to grow. Have it be an organization that stays together. In other mm -hmm. words, it can't have constant you know, turnover and it can't be churning a lot of their people because that intellectual capital that leaves is a big part of what helps make the business be successful. And if mm -hmm. I see a new person every single time I go into a, a restaurant or every single time I go into a business that I use regularly, it, it creates a disconnect for me when mm -hmm. I go in there. Uh, I, it, when I see the same person over and over again and we create and we build relationships that causes me to want to come back there. And, and certainly that person is more knowledgeable after working with me for a year or two years or five years than they would have been, you know, they, and on day one. And yeah. then the third thing is that there has to be a financial, um, a financial gain for everyone. There can't, it can't be just for the customers and nothing for the, the company and nothing for the people. So yeah. there has to be a balance to all that. And without that, I don't think a, a business can be successful. That, and that's true whether it's a traditional structure or it's a multi-level marketing company that has, you know, hundreds of thousands of independent contractors. Yeah. Because um, you're still, um, you know, there's still rules and, and laws that you have to follow in order to be successful. And I don't mean laws like the government laws. I mean, I mean, business laws in terms of how you treat your people and uh, how you go to market and those types of things. Yeah. So you, you brought up um, independent consultants because that's kind of the name, the generic name I give independent contractors. They're 1099 contract employees with. Sure. Um, my next question is, so in, in this community of education of talking about the, the, the potential dangers of multi-level marketing, um, a point of contention that we kind of go back and forth with pro multi-level marketers is, do independent consultants own, like, are they the business owner? Do they own their own business? Because the anti MLMers say you're a contracted employee. It can be taken from you at any time. You're not a business owner. And the people who are in the multi-level marketing community say, I'm running my own business. I'm, I'm filing my taxes. I'm paying for an assistant. I'm so I think there's a big disconnect. And so what, what's your perspective? Um, so this is, this is one of those, I probably, I probably, um, fall more on, a, on the side of the multi-level marketing proponents. If they're saying that that person is running their own business, I would agree with them. Uh, they are running okay. their own business and I don't have really have a, I don't have a, um, a cross to burn or I don't have a, uh, an anti MLM bias necessarily. My yeah. issues with MIM, uh, or MIM, MLM. Um, organizations, DC, is the fact that um, more people aren't making money at it. In mm -hmm. other words, I don't think fundamentally an organization can have stability and long-term opportunity unless the people at the, you know, at the bottom and the mid levels are being successful. 
Otherwise, yeah. you have so much churn that creates so much attention and focus by everyone of just replacing that level that the business can't do the better things it wants to do. Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, um, do I think that a person who runs their own MLM company by selling the products to people and um, and potentially recruiting other people to come work with them um, it, it's and, and join them in their journey, if you will, and mm-hmm. is paying all their bills. And I mean, that's what a business looks like, whether you want to call it that or not. Now, can yeah. they quit that company and go take it to another company? It's their business, they right? Can, but the, the product they can't take, but they can take the the organization and the, and the relationships that they've built and those types of things and go to another organization and do that, or they can find their own product and do it themselves. So mm-hmm. I would argue that that is a, I mean, they, they have a business, they have a legitimate business. They're a CEO of their company and yeah. it's to the benefit of the multi-level marketing company to keep that person happy and enthused and motivated and feeling, um, feeling a part of an organization. Because, I mean, I, I know just in the news recently, I mean, there's been a m- number of defects uh, defectors from various multi-level marketing companies because they got sideways or the company got sideways with some of the things that the that the independent contractors who had their own business uh, decided they didn't want to stay, you know, continue to participate. Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a good point. And I, I guess I was on the other side of that, um, that answer before talking to you because I, it is an easy thing to get caught up in saying, oh, you're not a business owner. You're a 1099 contract employee. But I mean, and re- it, but when you're bringing up those points, you know, am I losing anything by acknowledging that when I'm having a conversation with a pro multi-level marketer? I don't think so. But, you know, it's 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 a it's a give and take, too. But I think like it adds more potentially adds more credibility to the conversation that I'm not just saying like, you're not a business owner, you're blah, blah, blah. And like, yeah, you are, you are a contract employee, but you are, you are running the day to day. The more the, the work you put in is your decision. You know, it's not your uplines. They can't force you to do anything. I think, hey, the, people, do the job. <laughs> I think the people that are successful um, or the people that uh, end up becoming successful realize that they have to treat it like their own business, even if even if it has some aspects of it that are, in fact, not um, a traditional business model, if you will. They have to treat it that way and they have to and they have to be ferociously protective of the things that are important for their business. Yeah. That includes information, you know, knowing, you know, what it takes to be successful, knowing what the, the very real risks are and and making sure they have you know transparent and legitimate conversations with the people that are quote unquote supporting them to make mm-hmm. sure they really are doing that and we're yeah. sure they're really putting their their the best interest first yeah and i th- i mean i guess like it's hit or miss whether i have found um whether i have found uh Good people, obviously, in net, in network marketing who are doing the right things aren't being put on display because the bad behavior is getting the attention. And we don't want the bad behavior in the industry because that bad behavior exploits others, in my mm-hmm. opinion. You know, you're talking earlier about the churning that happens because the front line or the very bottom of the period kind of uh, pyramid bears the cost or bears the the burden of that cost and if they are constantly turning over the person at the top says i could either do a better job and keep them here or take a little bit longer in recruiting because i'd be presenting information in a better way or i could just replace the people i'm losing you know what i mean like they, yeah, it, every it, organization it, has uh, stability in the ranks is critical to profitability i mean that's the bottom line the more stable my the people are that work under me, wh- whether they're their own business or their employees, the more um, the more those people show up every day for work year after year after year, the more profitable the company is because they built all this intellectual um, capital that they bring to work every day and use it for the benefit of the company. Now, if if I hire ten or twenty. Um, consultants and next month I've got to hire ten or twenty more because all those folks left. Yeah. 
then that is an exhausting task because I've got to continue that process in order to just build that base level. Now, would that be different if I, you know, if instead of hiring 10 and losing nine, I could hire 10 and, and, and keep nine. Yeah. What would that look like? What would my, what would your job look like in a situation like that? And so, uh, you know, I think that it's important um, just like an, just like a tr- in the traditional business to make sure the people that, that work for you are, are happy and motivated and working on the right things. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Melissa. Um, she says, isn't it sort of hinky though, that in their contracts with the multi-level marketing company, that it specifically stated that representatives are not business owners yet. They publicly that yet they publicly uh, that's claim it. interesting. And I can't speak to the legality of that. I'm not sure what they're trying to, um, legislate with that quote unquote contract that they have. Uh, I don't really know enough about it, Melissa, to be able to give feedback on that. I will say that if, if I'm, you know, if you're telling me that all my costs, if I'm bearing all my costs um, and I'm running the risk of being in business or out of business based on my, my profitability, then I would argue that I'm a business owner. I may, I may not own your business, but I own my business. Yeah. She follows it up with, um, I ask as a co-owner of a business where we create and market our own original products. Yeah. So you so, know that. Yeah. And I think it is hard for small business owners who do not have an association with a multi-level marketing company. They're not contractors with that company to hear, I'm a business owner, I'm a business owner, I'm a business owner. And they are... Do, yeah. Making the pro- making the products, selling the products, paying for the marketing, paying for their website, doing the SEO, PPC, like going to the trade shows, doing. I mean, a lot of some independent consultants do that as well. But I think it's a again, it's a it's just a, a it's a gap in in that conversation for sure. And and there's a lot of different kinds of businesses. You know, franchise businesses, for example, are businesses that that where. Um, an owner actually reports up to um, a company and, and and they're required to behave in a certain way because they are representing that company with a very specific brand, you know, whether it be a fast food company or whether it be a marketing company that, that are franchises, you buy um, that business, if you will, but you're also regulated by the, the company that you that you work for and with to yeah. behave in a certain way as long as you're associated with that business. Mm. And so that's, it's, it's kind of, there's lots of, there's not really a, here's, um, here's X over here, let's call it traditional business. And then here's this, well, this Y over here and that or and that's the multi-level marketing independent consultant. And there's a whole bunch of things in it. There's a whole bunch yeah. of iterations and that's just one of a whole bunch. Yeah. Um, I guess this is going to be a controversial question because <laughs> most of the people who watch my channel are anti <laughs> multi-level marketing, but do you see a positive impact from multi-level marketing? And if yes, what would you say the most positive impact is? Okay. And, that, and that's another great <laughs> question. Uh, and, and, uh, before everybody tunes me out, <laughs> I have, have this to say, I absolutely do see some positive impacts. Um, I think I think relationships, I think there are key relationships that are developed. I think being around um, a group of people that um, theoretically are positive and motivated and all working towards a task, uh, a goal in mind, um, that's a plus. I think having a business plan that is well articulated and uh, and you have success stories of people that have done it before is a plus. I know um, just from my background in sales, um, finding um, a, a way to be successful from someone else who's already um, taken all the arrows and all the wounds and stuff like that from that, and then being able to execute on that and make it better and make it all mine, it was a very, very important part of uh, in some of the situations in, in being successful in various various um, positions in my career. And so knowing that there might be 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 different um, stories or vignettes of, of people that have that have made it um, successfully in, in an organization, um, all that that um, that's a valuable 
Um, that's valuable property, if you will, to that you can steal and swipe. And, you know, if somebody has a good logo or a good slogan or creates a good marketing piece, you know, I can go steal that and use that for my business. And I say steal in a, in a good positive way. I can swipe that and, and make it mine and, and put my own spin on it. And, you know, and I don't, I don't have to I don't, don't have to fight for that. People will actually give it to me. Those are all positives from being a part of a company where a lot of other people are doing the same thing. Now, having said that, is it all um, roses and, you know, milk and cookies? The answer is no. And, you know, legitimately, there are people in there that uh, say they're uh, there. They have your back and are doing the things that they, you know, to help you be successful. And in reality, they may be doing things that help them be successful. And, and you're just there for the ride. Yeah. So uh, I'm not saying that everything is good about that. But is there a positive impact from multi-level marketing? Yes. And I think that I mean, I look back on all the different things that I've done over the years, whether I was successful or not. And I feel like I can pull positive things away from all of those. Mm. And so I think. I think the challenge is, um, do I am I emotionally mature enough to be able to say, okay, I, I get to own part of the mistakes that I've made, but I don't want to lose the good stuff from the things that I've experienced. So I want to I want to put that in my piggy bank, so to speak. I want to yeah. I want to keep that um, yeah. and, and take the stuff that maybe wasn't as good and put that to the side and say, okay, well that wasn't a positive, but I'm not going to lose this positive piece as a result of that. I'm going to keep that. So yeah. I can I can let that continue to accumulate and grow and hopefully make me a better person as I you know as I move on. Yeah, that's good. Um, we had a couple of questions come in. Okay. So, um, I can't number, read them, so you have to read them for me. I know. I'm gonna I'm gonna put them on the screen for you. Okay, um, Jessica <laughs> said, "If we can agree that they are business owners, do you think they should be considered small businesses?" Jessica, that's a great question. Uh, um. I guess my question would be, how do they do their taxes? Do they not um, do their multi-level marketing business as a their own business? They have costs and um, and other kinds of things that they put on there to to record what their actual profits were. Yeah. Um, so from what I understand, each company, each MLM sends out um, a, whatever the right form is, where it it lists all of what you earned. Um, all of the trips that you earned, all of the car payments that you received, mm -hmm. because all of it's taxable. And then you get that and you and then you write down like I use this much space for my office. And if you're going to list it like that. So, I mean, tax wise, tax wise might be a different answer than saying like, oh, yeah, they're a small business. But yeah, I'm not an attorney and I'm not. <laughs> an account. Uh, but um and so having said that, I, I guess the perspective is if I'm, I'm recording those costs, I, I, for example, I, when I was a, a, an employee at uh, David Weekly Homes, which is a, um, a home builder based in the Houston area, um, there were costs that I had as a salesperson that worked for David Weekly. I was an employee of David Weekly, but I did have costs that, that I bore, if you will. I paid for out of my own pocket because I choose to, to grow my business. Um, that I that I put on my taxes and that and that I wasn't a business owner from that perspective. But as a 1099 employee, I think it falls in a different category. So okay. Um, we have another question. <laughs> so and this is a two part question. So I'm going to read the first part and then I'm going to pull up the second part. Okay. Okay. So here's the first part. Melissa says MLM contracts I have seen also specify that their representatives are not franchise owners either. Right. And MLMs are not required to make the same disclosures franchise parent companies are. Okay. Um, there sure. are, yeah, there are enough differences there that it's not really comparable to being a franchise owner. So, what is it? Okay. Um, again, um, not uh, I'm not um, writing laws somewhere for someone, but it, it's, <laughs> it's a it's a different entity in and of itself. I mean, as a as a 1099 employee, you're you're not a, a you don't own a franchise because that in, involves a um, there's a legal uh, that's a legal entity uh, yeah. where you're actually a part of the company but a separate part of the company. Um, as a 1099 employee, you're not a part of the company. You're free to do what as long as you're following the rules of the company. You're free to do what you want to do. Okay. And like just like you're free to sell you know sell the products at whatever price you pick. Even now they have a they have a recommended or, you know, a retail price that they talk about, but 
you know, if you cut that retail price, you're allowed to do that. Yeah. Um, and with franchises, that's not the case. You're you're required to follow that their guidelines from a cost perspective, um, very very carefully. So so yeah, it's it's a different kind of a company. Uh, that there's not just like I said earlier, there's not just one or two kinds of companies. There's lots of kind of companies, and I mean MLM falls in one of those odd gray groups. Um, yeah. I, I'm. So my question back to to you folks that are out there in the uh, either, I guess most of the folks that are out there are former MLM folks as opposed to current MLM <laughs> folks. But if you're, whatever you are, um, how does that? How do you see yourselves? That's a, I think that's an important part of the, the question. I mean, how do you see yourself? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess transitioning into this question. Other than the occasional negative perspective from public opinion, what do you say is a negative influence of multi-level marketing? Um, I, I think the best way to to describe this, uh, I think from, and this is from my this is my opinion. So um, just take it for whatever it's worth. It's some guy <laughs> talking on the internet. Uh, <laughs> but I would say, um, you know, integrity is a big thing for me. Um, saying what you do and doing what you say, that's, that's important. And I think that there's a difference between spinning the truth and telling the truth. Mm. I think that, um, I think that when you're transparent and when you work with your people in a way that, that, um, articulates what reality really is and gives them clear and specific information about what success looks like then you're more likely to attract the kind of people that appreciate that. And I think what happens so many times, I mean, my wife and I have attended um, multi-level marketing meetings. And of course, you know, they could never say what it was. And, you know, if they told you they'd have to kill you kind of a thing. And, uh, and so ended up, so you always knew kind of what you're going into, but you were usually going there because someone that invited you was a really good friend and uh, they, you go to church with them or whatever the case might be. And so there's this, connection is this relational connection that brings you in and then they talk about um the sky being um whatever color you want it to be and um you know having been a business and business owner and knowing what the challenges are in a business my expectation when i hear about someone who's got a business going is it's going to be really hard it's going to be really challenging you're going to spend some money you're going to have to work long hours and and what i hear is making money and spending one or two hours a week and not really um it sounds like you know a dream come true yeah. And I don't know any businesses like that. I, I mean, I have never been associated with businesses like that. I, just from the, the experience that, that DC that you had brought up to me about your time with um, Young Living, for example, or even Mary Kay, you know, the, the ladies that, that have parties, for example, or the guys that have parties, whatever, and I say yeah. ladies, they could be either one. Um, you know, they talk about their, their party and how much money they made. But the reality is, is you have to put a lot of time into – into making those things happen. There's a lot of back work that goes on in order to be able to have this dog and pony show that, sh that, you know, where people come and they're all excited and they're buying stuff and everyone's happy and they're giving high fives and wants to find out more. That's all great, but there's a whole lot of work that goes in there. And yeah. business owners spend, you know, months and months and sometimes years and years of losing money, getting to a point and, and working long hours and doing all the things, paying the price so that they can eventually get to a point of being successful. And so anytime I hear somebody tell me something that, that sounds like something for nothing, mm -hmm. I always am a little bit skeptical about that. I just, it doesn't pass the smell test, so to speak. And yeah. so I've, I've never, you know, found myself in a situation where I ever walked away and said, Oh, I can buy off on that. You know, when I first experienced the, the whole Southwestern thing, they told me I'd have, I'd have to work 80 hours a week and mm. that I was going to experience lots and lots of rejection. And I, you know, and, you know, I, I looked at the person that was, that had invited me who had saved up, you know, as a college student back in 19, uh, 1976, the girl across the hall from me that, you know, we hung around together um, had brought back a check after all of her expenses for almost $4,000. And I said, well, can I work as hard as that person? And, you know, and I, I felt like I could because mm. I had, I could see what 
at, at least at that point in time, I could see what I thought was it was going to be like. It was totally different when I got out there because it was, you know, you can talk about 80 hours a week and knocking on doors, but the reality is it's hard. <laughs> and there's a lot of emotion that they don't, they can't um, put into words. But yeah. having said that, that's the biggest, um, that's the biggest issue that I have. If someone comes to me and says, hey, here's the, the work that you have to legitimately do and in order to be successful, then all of a sudden I'm hearing that because it, it connects with a core that I'm, that I'm attuned to. If someone mm -hmm. came to me and said, hey, here's all the hours I put into my multi-level marketing company, and here's the costs that it takes to, to generate $100 of profit, then that would be, a, oh, okay, that makes sense. I, I know P&Ls and I, that, I can work with those numbers. Okay, yeah. you know, and if that turns into, you know, if that's 14 hours to turn into that, you know, maybe making $7.50 an hour isn't what I want in the beginning, but am I willing to do that in order to be able to get to the big picture? But yeah. the problem is I don't, I never hear that. And I'm, I'm almost discouraged from asking the questions at those quote unquote recruiting meetings to ask those questions. So, um, so it, it, it ended up, you know, it just, it just didn't, um, it didn't align itself with the integrity gene, if you will, that I have. Yeah. Um, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. I was reading a few questions came in. Okay. From Melissa again. Okay. Um, <laughs> Melissa, is there like a, do you get a gold star if you ask more than five <laughs> questions? Well, she's going to be like in in or seared into the internet memory because I'm going to put all her questions on here. So <laughs> this video is going to, unless it gets flagged by disparaging a multi level marketing company, but I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm not breaking any contracts now because I'm not a rep for any of them anymore. But <laughs> she says, um, it's been my experience in multi-level marketing that although freedom to do things the way you would like is touted as a benefit, it is not exactly the reality. There are lots of rules and restrictions. Good good point. There are. There's yeah. rules everywhere. There's rules yeah. for all companies. Yeah. Um, some of them are put in by the government. Some of them are put in by the people that you, the products that you sell. Some of them are just put in by good judgment. Uh, some of them are put in by the people in charge. There are. I mean, yeah. you know, whenever there are um, there are going to be rules and there's, there are going to be um, guardrails. Sometimes the rules are intended to be protective. Yeah. Um, so you don't steer off into ground that, you know, the, the district attorney of the state of Florida, you know, <laughs> want to come talk to you. But. The reality is, is it, it's not um, it's not like the Wild West. You know, you can't go out there and just do whatever you want to do and whatever you feel like. I mean, that's um, that's a different yeah. kind of an organization that um, typically is on the is on the blacklist for the Department of Justice. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, it does. It, sometimes it does feel like and I'm just going to use my experience in Young Living. It does feel a little bit like the Wild West because there's so, because the rules seem insurmountable when they talk with the restrictions that they put on you for not making health claims, not, you know, prescribing oils for ailments, all this stuff. And it's like, well, if nobody catches me, I'm good because I have to, why are they going to buy my oil? If I'm not going to say that it's going to fix a, B, C, or D. Well, literally, <laughs> literally that has not gone through the testing. It's supposed to, to be able to say, this helps with this and they it because it's in the supplement category so to maintain that they have to say like you need to be restrictive with your language but the consultants are saying this is too restrictive how can i recruit and it's like literally it's protecting the consumer but they're just like mm -hmm. nope nope <laughs> that's how it feels from what i've seen in my own you know facebook groups when i was part of the organization so we'll just yeah um a few more questions um <sighs> okay, so she clarified when she says rules and restrictions, she means directly from the multi-level marketing company. As a business owner, I'm very familiar. No, and I, I, all I'm saying is that um, that I think every business has rules and restrictions. Yeah, um, that's not necessarily um, just a multi-level marketing thing. I, I do think that some of the rules and restrictions are designed to be um, helpful and protective of you, but. I mean, sometimes rules and restrictions can um, be limiting and frustrating. I mean, you know, I'm in. A, I'm, I work for a company now. I'm not a business owner today, and uh, they have had some rules that some of which were 
only in place for a very short period of time, some of which were in place for a longer period of time that I disagreed with. Yeah. And um, that doesn't, but if I work at that company, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to choose to, to, to follow the rules that they asked me to do. Um, you know, my first, my first priority is really for the customer. I mean, yeah. is it the right thing to do for the customer? Mm. And sometimes it, when those things come in conflict, then I have to bring them up to a higher up and say, Hey, look, you know, we're not doing the right thing to, for the customer. And that, and if that's our, if that's our number one goal, if that's our number one priority, how do we, um, how, you know, how do we address this issue that is apparently in conflict? Yeah. And so I think that you have to, you have to have a, um, a sense of what true North is, Melissa, on, on all these things. And, you know, there are some, you know, and if there are rules and regulations that says, hey, you know, this is not OK. And you're like, I, I can't work here because of that. Then you have a, you know, you have a moral decision to make about whether or not that's the right company for you. But yeah. that, that that doesn't just happen in multi-level marketing companies. That happens in all kinds of companies. Yeah. It happens in relationships. Um, mm -hmm. when you, when you, and perhaps a person in, your, in a relationship, uh, you know, come up to a point where, you know, you struggle with, with the things that each other in it, and, you know, you ask yourself, does it, does the relationship come first or does this issue mean that we can't be as close as we want to be? Yeah. Yep. Um, next question. If you could change one thing about the multi-level marketing structure, what would it be? Hmm. I, I don't necessarily know that I know enough about the structure to be able to say one thing. Um, but I think the, the one thing I find in business that is the key, a, a key foundational block, if you will, is communication mm. and transparency of communication and being doing what you say and saying what you'll do. And I think that in, whether it's in multi-level marketing or traditional business or whatever, I think we all profess that we we think we all do that, but nobody, but other people don't do that. And yeah. I think the reality <laughs> is is that our opportunity is, as a from a, in, in an organization, is to make our organization uh, more transparent, more transparent with the customer, more transparent with the individual employees, so that uh, we we become we build our reputation and then our reputation builds us because as we get perceived as an organization that be, that does the right thing, then that attracts certain kinds of people to us. It yeah. attracts uh, customers to us. It builds our internal, um, the value of the organization. And so if there's one thing I would change about business in general, it's, it's creating better communication pipelines and making sure that the people at the top, are talking to the people at the bottom and listening uh, when they when they ask them how are things going, because I think there's a lot of information that gets lost in the filtering up that yeah. would be valuable if people said, "Hey, let me go let me go talk to the frontline employees and find out what's really happening." So that would yeah. be the one thing I would I would change about business in general. Well, that example really showed itself with the Boeing company. The way they used to do business was if anybody at the at the line when they were building planes saw something, they had the authority to stop production, even yeah. if it was just and and as the company changed hands and got bigger and stuff, that process changed and it it became more of a, a like a in the clouds with the upper management. Yeah you know, not really acknowledging the people down below. And it got into a really bad situation with that, the line air crash and all that other stuff that happened. So yep. there was a reason for it. There's a reason yeah. for it. And there's a reason yeah. why, I mean, companies that have great communication and build great internal, um, internal employee relationships um, that pays for itself. Yeah. Whether it's a multi-level marketing organization or, or a traditional business or one of the 15,000 variations of that. Yeah. Um, Matthew has a question. Uh, do you find that multi-level marketing focuses most of their revenue generating efforts on recruiting rather than making customers of the product? Mm, great question, Matthew. And uh, I don't, uh, um, because I don't know all the ins and outs from a multi-level marketing perspective, I've not ever been in a multi-level marketing company per se, although you could argue that the Southwestern company was. Um, the, here's the reality that I see it and the way I see it. If people don't sell stuff, not sell things to the bottom line of their company, but sell mm. things to 
consumers that consume their products, the company doesn't have a long-term viable opportunity. And so, um, you know, you can recruit everybody you want to, but if they don't sell something, then ultimately, the, you know, the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. So uh, I, I think it's a, it probably is um, two things that are equally important. It's important to sell and it's important to recruit. You have to do both in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. And um, and because a multi-level marketing company is theoretically talking to people about part time incomes and doing things on your own and, you know, it's your schedule and work when you want to and make 500 bucks a month and that type of thing. They need to they need to have people that would be that are going to win if that's a situation, but they have to sell to someone. I mean, you yeah. can't enjoy that product with your bottom line of your company and stay in business long term. Yeah. Um. Julie Joe is uh, another creator here on YouTube and she has a question. Okay. Um, she says, what do you think about the argument that distributors are the biggest customers and that, so maybe if you're not aware of that, that is a huge point of contention with the people who see a lot of the dangers of multi-level marketing yeah. that um, because the upline is paid on what their downline purchases from the company, mm -hmm. If they're just as good as, you know, your recruiters now, because I'm making money. I make more money on you purchasing inventory from the company than if a customer purchases it from the company in most of the cases. OK. Uh, and, and now here's where I'm going to be. I'm going to um, I'm going to slice that a little bit and, okay. and say that I don't believe at some point in time your your distributors can can warehouse only so much. They only have so much money. Um, they can't be fundamentally, if, you're, if your distributors are your final product, then your company, your emperor has no clothes. Uh, mm. That's the bottom line. If your organization isn't a sales organization, if they don't sell something, then nobody ends up long-term making money. Um, you can't, I mean, at some point in time, their houses are only so big. They can only store so many <laughs> so many you know jars of oil or perfume bottles before yeah. or you know lipstick or little row clothes yeah enough is enough you know I, yeah. I don't have any more room yeah and if they're not selling it then it, it that, that can't be successful so if you look at successful mlm organizations they probably have a balance between selling and recruiting in other words they're they're, they're they've got to have some people selling somewhere because um, otherwise, you know, they've got a whole bunch of lipstick and blush and, uh, and rouge in their house that, you know, at some point in time is going to show up on somebody's Christmas list. Yeah. And, and the funny thing you say that, Dad, um, when I was in Young Living, there would be sales that would come up or there would a Black Friday would come up and my upline would say, this is a great time to stock up for Christmas presents. And I'm like, oh, let me just say this. Nobody in my family personally would love getting an essential oils a Christmas present. Like I have enough of like self-awareness to know that for real. And I'm like, I'm not going to buy $600 worth of inventory because you need the volume to rank up. And that is a very like jaded okay. perspective that I have for so sure. So having said sure. that, let me offer a different alternative. If, okay. their, if their communication was not to you, but to you as a salesperson to say, hey, here's some of the things you can talk to the, your customers about, then I would say that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate thing. You know, mm -hmm. talking to people about, Hey, good ideas for, for Christmas gifts, good ideas for birthdays. If you, if you love our products, then, you know, giving them would be a positive blah, blah, blah. Then that's a perfectly legitimate thing. If yeah. it's to talk to my, the people that work in my, um, in, in my downline for them to go buy that stuff then that's a little bit of a self-serving yes. position, I would say. Yeah. It would be and like I, it would be like my manager in my building company saying, Steve, I think you should buy a house because we have some really good homes right now. <laughs> and you know, I mean you can always sell it to somebody else. Yeah, but, it's you know, exactly my job like is not that. to inventory your house so that you can make eight hundred thousand dollars. And my job is to sell homes in my current role. Yeah. I yeah. So um, Jules, 
RM has a question. Uh, you mentioned transparency and communication as important to business. What are some other ethical standards you believe businesses should live up to? Mm. Um, you know, I'm a Christian. Uh, that's kind of a, that is a, that's a foundational piece for me. Uh, I think that ultimately from a business perspective, um, you should treat people like you want to be treated. If you, tr if you treat your customers the way you want to be treated, I think fundamentally, um, you, you are, are going to be in fairly good shape. Now that doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do everything for a customer just because they asked for it. I think that there are times when you have to say no to customers and I, per, and I think that's perfectly legitimate. But I think the way you say no to them and and um, and what you do to follow up on that is important too. Um, I the good news is is that you know treating people well and and building meaningful legitimate relationships and creating a business that people want to work with uh, it, it's not rocket science. It's yeah. hard because you have to execute every day on that. Mm -hmm. You have to go in and 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 uh, have a good face whether you whether you feel happy or not. Um, you have to treat people consistently well. Uh, that doesn't mean you, like I said, that you have to give stuff away. You can uh, hopefully you're making a great profit for the product that you do, and you and people love it. Yeah. But I, I think from an ethical perspective, I think that businesses ultimately. This is what I would. This is what I told my people for years and years and years in organizations that I, I worked with, is that the way you want to behave is is what if. The decisions that you're making show up on the front page of the newspaper. Mm. Do you still feel good about them? Do you still would you do the same thing? If you do, if you could do the same, if you said, "Yeah, I would," I would be doing the same thing regardless, and I would be, I'd be fine with them showing up on the front page of the newspaper. And I think you're doing the right things. Those are, would be some good ethical standards to live up to. If you're saying, "Hmm, I don't know if I'd want this." Um, on the front page. I don't even know if I'd want it on the sports section or, you know, maybe in some section that people don't read that much because yeah, like I, the classifieds I, wouldn't, or something. I wouldn't feel too good about it. Then that's probably a sign that you're in an area where you need to rethink what you're doing. And that yeah. has to do with, like I said, any kind of business. I think any kind of relationship, I think that that's a relational dynamic, not just a business dynamic because it's people to people. Yeah, I agree. And I guess um, just going a little bit personal for a second, I growing up being in, in um, you know, like school and church and everything I saw, I did not see people in authority positions um, apologize when they got stuff wrong. Now, that being said, my parents not being perfect, that is something that I saw executed all the time. So my dad... Um, when he got something wrong, there was a um, look you in the eyes and say, like, I am sorry, I shouldn't have done that. And and what I see a lot as people get bigger in these multi-level marketing or just bad leaders in general, they don't have they, they seem to not have the humility or at least the understanding of treating people well to say, like, hey, I screwed up and I'm really sorry because it's always oh you shouldn't have felt that way or i didn't mess up you took it the wrong way or whatever and i i guess for me that the um, other standards in business is the leaders treating their people the right way but also behaving themselves in a way that um it, it's more important for leaders it's more important and and my perspective is is that you're always teaching there's always somebody watching whether you pay attention or not um, I will say this, um, that, you know, part of the reason that Daniela, you heard me say those things, I'm sorry, DC, apologize, That's okay. um, <laughs> is that, um, is that it was, it, A, I was wrong. So I apologize for things that I needed to apologize for, but also because I think it's important for people to see that that's what you do. That's the behavior that needs, to, it's hard to model behavior you've never seen. And so when people don't ever see people apologize, they tend not to be people who apologize. Right. And we need to behave in a way that encourages people around us to behave the way that we would like them to behave as well. So leaders have an important um, and, and even more important responsibility there to to be in, to be held to a higher standard as far as that's concerned. Um, I saw a, a comment in in one of the in the chat about um, end retail customer sales, and 
you know, I, I, I will say this, the companies I work for, the Southwestern company, that's how they, um, they paid their commission to um, the, the other levels of the organization was it was based on whatever sales were actually delivered. If, if books got turned in at the end of the summer, then, you know, they didn't, nobody made any money on those and they went back into, into warehouse. So yeah. if, um, and if there's a, in, in, and if there's a, so the whole idea of sell, making commissions on wholesale inventory versus retail sales, that's, that certainly is one of those big um, sticking points, I would say, relative to the opportunity. Okay. Um Julie, Julie Joe has another question or another um, aspect, and this is mostly targeted towards multi-level marketing companies that produce consumable products like Mary Kay Cosmetics or Young Living. Like the because you're able to consume everything you purchase, it again that line is blurred. Um, so she says, but the issue nowadays is that the products are consumable. Therefore, the push to purchase monthly from uplines is a big deal to their downlines because the products run out. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's different with obviously like a clothing company where you're stuck if you can't move it, you know what I mean? It stays with you. You can't just, uh, my thought is you can't just throw clothes away. I don't know. But, um, but like with oils, I've got a lot of oils left over for sure. And yeah, am I going to get through them? Am I going to get through them in the next three years? Probably not. There's literally, <laughs> there's so much that they gave you for free or whatever. And it's like. Take part in the sale. And it again, it's consumable. So if I don't sell them, no big deal because I can just use them up, you know? And that's kind of a it's a it's a slow bling for me. Well, and I would say on, on that issue, if if you're getting into it, realizing and if people talk about the fact that hey, you're gonna have some some cost here related to that know that that's a part of your organization and, or know that's a part of the, the program and make sure you build that into your, your cost structure. Yeah. Um, again, from a full disclosure perspective, because I mean, I, I, I see that. I mean, yeah. You know, you, you send me that anti wrinkle cream and you know, I obviously didn't use enough of it. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, but, the, but the reality is, is that um, the, there, it, there is stuff that you use legitimately that this, these companies sell. And as a multi-level marketing direct, uh, a, a, a person that is in the organization, uh, I'm not saying that, the, that that person shouldn't buy from the company. If you believe in the product, you're going to use the product. That's okay. Because you'll yeah. be spending that money on that stuff anyways. But at some point in time, you need to, you know, there needs to be a balance relative to the whole warehousing thing. Yeah, I agree. Someone said... We need a master's in business, a lawyer, and a psychologist to thresh out all the MLM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you, yeah, we'll have you and we'll have Dave and we'll yeah, have someone smarter than all of us, I guess, yes. that's for sure. Um, so since we've kind of already talked about like MLM business, if someone's dead set on staying in a multi-level marketing company, what would your advice be to them to improve their experience? Um you know, we, we talked about this earlier today and I said, I don't have, and I think every, uh, that answer is very specific to the person. Yeah. I, I will say this. I think that if you're treating people the way you want to be treated, then that's a good thing. Yeah. If you're, if you're um, communicating with them openly and honestly about what, what the real deal is and encouraging them to both sell and recruit and that you're, you're, and you explain the financial benefits and, and the pitfalls in that process and you're encouraging them based on their legitimate best interest, what their best interests are in mind, as far as that goes, then uh, I'm not, I, like I said, I don't, I don't have a bias and, and I wouldn't be arguing with people to have them not work for a multi-level marketing company. Yeah. I just think that the way you have to live your life with integrity and that includes all aspects. You can't have integrity in one area and not have it show up somewhere else and vice versa. Right. Yeah. I agree. I mean, my advice for them would be to please do a profit and loss statement because knowing that answer would benefit you either way. That's because, just a, I mean, that's just a business thing. I mean, yeah. if, they're, if they're trying to run their business without doing a profit and loss statement, then it, it's like it's like trying to find your way out of a dark room that you, that you don't have. You've never walked in before. You're going to bump, right. bump into things and falling down all the time. Yeah. So profit yeah. and loss statements have a way of turning the light on and letting you see where you're making your mistakes and where you're being successful. 
Yeah. I, I don't see any way that, that they would not do that. Yeah. Um, Multi-level marketing, it's kind of a contentious issue sometime. It definitely put a lot of stress on my uh, marriage um, and it, it, it impacts other people differently. But what would your advice be to a loved one who feels tension about their relative or friend being in a multi-level marketing company? Mm, another great question, DC. Uh, <laughs> I would say, um, um, I would say, my approach would be to uh, be a friend with them and ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge, I think, that you're faced with in situations where you want to talk to them about the evils of multi-level marketing or whatever the case might be, is that they've been prepped by their uplines on that exact thing. Yeah. And so you become the enemy at that point in time r rather than the friend. I mm. think the better approach to take is to um, be caring and ask questions and encourage them to find their way on their own. Um, you don't necessarily have to say you agree. Yeah. But you can understand, I mean, I don't have to feel the same way you do to understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, the whole idea is, is that I can tell the difference between a chicken and an egg and I've never laid eggs before. Right. Um, so uh, I can I can hear what you're saying and I can just offer you perhaps a different viewpoint, acknowledging that ultimately it's not my decision that's getting made. It's your decision that's getting made. And you know, can we be friends in spite of the fact we don't necessarily agree? Hopefully we can. Yeah. Um, I think oftentimes what happens is, is all this emotion that people have about multi-level marketing in the first place. And so they want to get on their high horse and convince everybody else of the same things that they feel about rather than being able to take more of an, an emotional um, perspective and ask questions that help someone else find their own way. Could you give some examples of questions that people could ask? Um, I, I say this because sometimes it's hard. Like you want to ask those questions that don't have an ulterior motive, but maybe I wouldn't necessarily know where to start. So could you just give us like a few, a few ideas? Uh, um, you know, I, I would ask them, for example, how are things going? Um, to, you know, tell me a little about your business. Tell me what's going on in your business right now. And maybe ask them a few questions about um, that help that might, um, based on what they what they answer, you know, asking questions perhaps about financial stuff. You know, yeah. maybe saying, "Great, you know, it sounds like you've really, really been successful um, selling that. Does uh, does is that translating into you know cash in your pocket? And if not, you know, what are the you know how 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 could you improve that? How could it get better? In other words, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm yeah. just saying you know, what, what would, what would improve the situation that you're in right now? You know, do you need more time? Should you maybe know, you know, what else are you spending money on? Is that a part of what they pay for? Is that a part of what you pay for? Yeah. You know, do you know how much money a month you spend on that kind of stuff? Where does it, you know, in other words, help them understand, you know, Hey, congratulations on that great party you just did. Yeah. You know, it looks like you really worked hard to get that, to get there. You know, did you spend a lot of time, calling people and setting things up. Oh yeah. You know, and they talk about that. Okay, great. Well then, then all of a sudden you're talking about meaningful specific situations that they're involved in and you're not trying to talk them out of or into anything. You're just talking about things that they're relating to you. And as you go down that road, you can um, maybe ask some clarification questions that say, you know, gosh, it seems like you really worked a lot of hours, you know, how have you ever sat down and figured out how much per hour you're making on that? Is that, you know, is that something that's important to you? Well, you know, what's, all, what's your end in mind with, with all of this? How much money were you wanting to make a month when you got in? And, and has that changed since you started? You know, all of a sudden, those are, those are questions that aren't, you know, contentious fighting back and forth questions. Those are just, hey, I care about you and I'm just wanting to find out more. You know, yeah. tell me about what you're doing. Yeah, and, I think and, and, and maybe bite your tongue, you know, take a <laughs> handkerchief or something to wipe the blood off your mouth as you're biting your tongue. Yeah. But um, realize that they don't have to feel the same way you feel. Mm. If you're their friend, your opportunity is to help them just see more clearly what they're doing. Maybe they shouldn't get out of MLM. Maybe they should be there. Maybe that's what they're, you know, maybe that's what God really has for them. I don't know. 
Right. But um, I, I don't think that there's anything negative about helping them to ask more questions. Yeah. In order to be able to um, avoid avoid mistakes they're making now and be able to carve a new path going forward. I think that's really good. Um, I just have a few more questions. Uh, and maybe this is repetitive. I'm, I, we kind of covered a few things, but just so, um, do you think it matters if a multi-level marketing company is making money, but a majority of the independent consultants are not, or the independent contractors? If you think that it matters, why? Well, I mean, unless they're a 501 C, you know, 3C <laughs> organization that's just giving away money um, for the benefit of other people, you know, of course it matters. I mean, right. if, if their people aren't, if the people that work for the company aren't making money, then fundamentally they don't have a, they don't have an ongoing organization that will stand in and of its, you know, by itself. Yeah. And I don't think there's any way that if, it, that if the independent consultants aren't making money, that, that, they're, they're, and I would argue that, that, most people at the top of the of the uh, these MLM companies want their multi, want their uh, independent contractors to make money because that's how they make money. If they if, if uh, ultimately you know if if everyone sends their product back and gets ninety percent back, um, that 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 business model doesn't last. Right. It's not. It, it will not be a successful long term business model. Yeah. So they it's, people have to sell, and they and they have to be make it and to be selling and making money because ultimately, if they are not making money, businesses go bankrupt. Right. You well, know, they might go bankrupt because a spouse says, "Hey, I've we funded it enough. We can't go further." It right. might be because the person says, "There's just too many. There's not enough hours in the day to be able to, for the, all the work that I'm putting in. I'm not seeing the results for it." There's got to be a payout for for them as it goes forward. Otherwise, it's not a viable op opportunity. I can I can help people all I want to, but if they aren't being successful, they won't stay around. Right. And there's no business that can is going to be successful if the middle and bottom of that business is always churning at seventy or eighty or ninety percent. It just it's not viable. Right. Um, for the people. This is this is coming from like a hypothetical situation. If you if someone believes. If you were someone who believed that multi-level marketing companies were doing more harm than good towards that middle and lower tier of independent consultants, do you think that someone other than the market should step in? And I, that's a little bit of a confusing question because, like you were saying, not all businesses survive. So <laughs> the market kind of churns please, a little bit. <laughs> please yeah. don't don't call <laughs> Joe Biden and tell him this. Oh my gosh, oh my we're God. not getting political. Cut that out. <laughs> Okay. Oh my God. Oh. Okay. Is that my channel? Here's the reality. Here's the reality. Um, right now, there's there are um, parts of the federal government that that kind of that are in an oversight um, responsibility for some of these kinds of things, and and they're overwhelmed with just the level that they're at. Do I think that someone uh, should step in? I, I think that if multi-level marketing companies don't uh, are doing more harm than good towards their independent consultants. My hope is that their, their independent consultants are smart enough to say, Hey, this is a bad deal. I'm getting out of this. Yeah. Uh, right. Because, uh, you know, if someone were to say, Hey, I want you to start an organization that's going to oversee all these millions of people <laughs> and what they're saying and what they're doing, I just say, just shoot me first. Oh my God. Now, that would be an exhausting and ultimately a failure. Um, of, a, of a job for anybody. I mean, they, you couldn't win in a situation like that, I don't think. Yeah, I guess it just feels like the people who could step in to enforce the rules that multi-level marketing is supposed to be following are getting paid, are getting their campaigns contributed to by the multi-level marketing company. So it feels a little bit of a lost... Um, it, it get it feels a little bit like a lost cause sometimes when you see like the campaign donations and um, it, it's very like the recently Monat got or Monate Modern Nature shampoo um, was fined by the Attorney General of Florida mm -hmm. because one of their little consultants said their supplement would help with I'm not gonna say it because I don't want someone to flash my channel but would help with what you got during the panini. And so 
um, they got fined two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, mm. and that consultant yeah. was let go. Okay. But again, that is a lot of man hours doing the investigation, then talking and coming to a deal with Mo- Monet Monat Monat. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and so it just feels like that that wasn't just one consultant. Like, yeah, they made an example of one person. It's rampant across the board. I mean. You, it, it's just, it feels like yeah. oh, the, you, if sometimes it feels like YouTube is the only way to get information out. So at least here's a balanced, and I say balanced, <gasps> it's so positive for one side, and then we're obviously giving the other side of it. But it's like, it's, I don't know, I don't really know what I'm saying, but it feels sometimes like a lost, like a lost cause. Okay. Let me, um, let me. Offer something else, and, and again, I, I don't. I don't have an axe to grind with multi-level marketing companies per se, yeah. other than the fact that I think that there's uh, there there are issues in them, like in some other company organizations that, that need to be fixed. The there is someone who needs to step in, and that those are the people that own the companies, mm. because the uh, because ultimately, if the owners um, own that piece, then they have a motivation to make it better. Because, right. you know, as they fix that situation, their incomes go up, not down. Right. And as they fix the whole churn situation and the communication situation in the organization, the organization improves. And right. it, while it may not necessarily be a tomorrow kind of a thing, um, there there is incentive there um, for their business to, the, for their businesses to get better. And I do I believe that everybody at the top level of those organizations. Uh, you know, I, I think there are some some folks up there, men and women, who legitimately want the right things for the people that come to work for their company, right. and they uh, those are the people that, frankly, most of the, the responsibility is on because they're the ones that ultimately chart the course that ends up getting pushed down through the you know hundreds and thousands of um, people down below them. So right. there's people there, whether it gets done and how quickly it gets done, you know, I, I don't know what that looks like. Yeah. Well, this is my very last question. Um, number 14. <laughs> so I don't, you've listened to some of my commentary. There's a, there's a somewhat large community talking about the, the exploitation that can happen in multi-level marketing companies. Mm-hmm. In your opinion, what do you think that we as a community who's trying to educate on the potential dangers what could we do better to address um, address the issues or address, I mean, really, like, in education terms, more clearly here on YouTube? Um, boy, that's a great question. And I think uh, I, I haven't seen the vast majority of it. I've seen only maybe 20 or 30 examples of what that looks like. It seems like there's lots of hype to get views based on really funny poking fun at people. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be legitimately any meaningful um, listening going on. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there, I think that the idea of uh, doing what you're saying here, educating on the potential dangers has to do with, um, asking questions and and being able to present things in a in a format that allows people to make their own decisions, yeah. and I, I think it's uh, the cautionary tale is to not not in the midst of getting views. I mean, you're all about you know building your channel and getting views, and I understand that and it needs to be fun and entertaining and all of those kinds of things. But I think it also at the same time um, it, that can be done in a respectful way that that does all those things too. Yeah. And I think that creating, um, you know, finding balance, asking yourself, you know, if I were on the other side hearing this, how would I, res- how would I be wanting to respond? Because ultimately, if you, if you legitimately think the people on the other side are the ones that you need to reach out to, then you have to get their ear. They have to feel right. listened to. And if they feel like they're being made fun of, then that's, that's unlikely to create, um, to create value and create a, a, a subscriber more than likely what you're doing is you're telling people to feel the same way that you feel the things that they want to hear to make themselves feel better. And so, right. um, so finding that balance, I think is an important 
piece going forward. Yeah, I think that some, um, from what I've seen, because the pull from these large leaders is, it's almost on the level of like cult of personality. I mean, I know that's more of like a governmental, um, like rules kind of thing, you know, when it's more like dictatorships, I understand that, but it's the draw when you sign up with a large leader or something because mm -hmm. they're so shiny and new and pretty. I think some, another, uh, one of the, one of the strategies has been to not necessarily like take that person down, but show say like, Hey, this person is not as shiny as you thought they were. And so I think the problem with that is it goes into the ad hominem, realm and it takes away from saying let's look at the profit and loss statement like i would love for you to not lose money because like it feels terrible it feels terrible having spent so much money in mary Kay, and and i worked over 40 hours a week initially being sold on hey this is gonna only be eight to ten hours a week okay well i don't mind working hard for sure but then also being encouraged to buy inventory um, and, and realizing after I truly understood the compensation plan that it benefited my upline, it didn't necessarily benefit my customers. It didn't necessarily benefit me. Yep. That was very painful. Yep. Um, but again, I like having come to this realization myself instead of getting bullied into that saying like, oh, my dad doesn't like multi-level marketing. I have to resolve this so I could still hang out. Like I never got any bad vibes from you about obviously I did two forays into multi-level marketing and I, you know, and it's like you didn't make me feel bad once about that. And so I, I, I see being, I guess, the person that could have been the example, like I appreciate not feeling like a piece of crap. You know, because there is some that like that tension where, you know, one of your family members maybe has a negative, a negative opinion about multi-level mm -hmm. marketing. There's no shame there. It's just like, man, I wish I would have come to the realization. <laughs> I wish I would have come to the realization sooner. So take the value that that you you, you learned in there and and use yeah. that for good. Right. That's where the that's where the plus is. Yeah. And I do want to bring that to the table here because, you know, I, I do have some differences of opinions about um, the business model. And I think like having an additional voice is, is maybe good in the industry. But um, so Jewel says this interview is good because the more people know about what an ethical business model looks like, the more they can spot an unethical one. And I think, again, it's empowering. It's empowering individuals to advocate for themselves with knowledge and with empathy and maybe an understanding of like what do good leaders look like and what are good characteristics of leaders and equipping them with that so then they can make the decision for themselves so yeah you bet thanks jules that was a good comment and and you know what danielle you make a oh, dc sorry about that um, <laughs> okay. you make a great comment um you've mentioned it several times i i, I don't know how multi-level marketing people don't create a p l for themselves I mean, that should be one of the things that the people have to do first thing starting out that they build. They, they have a monthly P&L that they work from to see where the money goes and see where their cash flow goes, because running a legitimate, viable business has, you know, it's about, you know, cash in and cash out. And yeah. so and, and then uh, and, and so that should be a requirement for right. these folks. Um, we have one more one more question. Uh, Matthew says, what are some red flags for you when you're trying to decide if someone is a good or a bad leader? Hmm. Um, Matthew, that's a, that, that probably is another five of these meetings. Um, it's a great, great question. I think that when people talk more about themselves and what's important for them than they do about their people, that's a good example. I think um, you've, I, I've, most great leaders that I've, I've participated in or worked for or had work in my business, um, they, they do a great job of asking people questions. They do a great job of listening and, um, and they make it a point to encourage the people around them to do the things um, to be successful. In other words, um, you know, micromanagement isn't really a part of their program more often than not. They're about participating and creating value and being and helping to serve the people that they work for. So 
Uh, that would be a little snippet, if you will. There's yeah. a ton more information there. There's some great books. And I think ultimately, you know, in our, in, in our heart of hearts, you know, God's planted a seed in all of us that, um, uh, and it, we call it intuition or a lot of things that help us to identify um, the good from the bad. You know, we all have BS meters, if you will, yeah. and, uh, and can tell when um, sometimes, I shouldn't say always, but um, over the, in the long run, you can tell when someone really is legitimately um, has your best interests at heart or not. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean they they always say the things that you like to hear on. Um, it doesn't even mean that you always like them, but, but ultimately if you, if you see a lot of those decisions get put in the good, good category, um, the leadership category, as opposed to the friend category, then I think that's a good sign. That's good. That's really good. Well, um, You've answered all of my questions. Do you have any closing words for <laughs> the viewers? Or um, I mean, I really appreciate you getting on and, and sharing some of your experience. What I've what I mean, obviously, I've had a lot more time with you than probably anybody who views my channel. But um, the balance perspective that you bring is very valuable, and I tend to not. I, I tend to like the idea of a balanced perspective, and I don't. I'm not really able to execute that. Like while I love resolving conflict with people, it's hard to, it's hard as I'm, I, I value it even more, but I want to be able to execute that and saying like, Oh, what is the other side of this? Cause you had several points about multi-level marketing company that I would have never thought of. And, and I wouldn't have naturally leaned towards even being able to discover that information on my own. So I I don't I really appreciate what you brought this conversation and I feel like it was packed with a lot of education too. So um, thank you so much and like do you have any do you have anything you want to say or do you think I asked you enough questions? <laughs> well, thanks, DC. I appreciate the opportunity to to talk to the folks that came online and hopefully um, the people that listen to YouTube um, going forward. Um, the the one thing I would I would mention. And the, the, the one item I would encourage everybody to do is spend more time listening, mm -hmm. you know, ask questions. Um, you don't have to take a position. If you just ask questions and then shut your mouth, you know, God gave us one mouth and two ears for a reason, <laughs> using the ears, you know, as much as we use the mouth. And sometimes we use the mouth more, um, but listen to what people are saying. And w when you listen to what people are saying, oftentimes they'll, they'll, They'll tell you what's the next next thing to ask by what they're saying and the way they're saying it. So if we do a good job listening and interacting, then what we'll find is two things. Number one is we'll find out a whole lot more. And the second thing is that um, people appreciate being heard. Mm. And ultimately, if, the, you know, if people appreciate something, they're more open to the things that you have to say too. So just... Just think about that. Um, the people in multi-level marketing aren't your enemies. They're not. They're people just like you who care about stuff just like you. You got uh, all of you on this call have gotten into multi-level marketing at some point in time because it was something that touched your heart and it was really important. And they did too. The people that are still in there, that that's how they feel. And they don't feel like they're doing the wrong thing in the midst of that. So right. if you do a great job of listening and caring and being their friend, then um then maybe they'll give you some insight that helps you uh, help them or vice versa. They, they, they may, there may be a light bulb that goes off for you that says, hey, this is an opportunity I can do over here. Maybe not a multi-level marketing opportunity, maybe a business opportunity, something right. that you can be your own CEO for. Um, but in any event, there's value for you if you um, if you spend time listening. So that's it. Thanks. Appreciate that's it. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciated all the questions and maybe uh, maybe XCal will will uh, be open to coming back for another guest uh, appearance, maybe looking at some some uh, multi-level marketing training. But I'll have to ask him off camera because I'm not going to get his snow recorded on a live. So <laughs> uh, I'll see you all next time. I'll see you all tomorrow for my live. And uh, thanks so much. Have a great evening. Bye. Thanks, everyone.